everybody. Welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We've got a fun show today. We're going to be talking about mellow corn. We're going to get a little bit of the history of that. And we'll be tasting two samples here, a vintage one and a current one. Uh, we'll be doing this side by side. One is a pre-fire. So it's uh, that's some of the very desirable stuff. At least if you follow on the internet and the fandom, everyone says that's uh, that's the, the one to get. But we're going to test this out by tasting these blind. It should be fun. And ultimately, we're going to just pick what our favorite is. So out of the two, we're going to say which one we like better. And we'll see if we like the pre-fire or the current version better. Got a couple of uh, folks that I want to introduce you guys to. So the main presenter uh, today uh, is Mr. Wes Harden. Wes, how you doing, man? Hey, Steve, everyone. How you guys doing? Good, good. So you got a fun, good, dusty good. forest today, man. Yep. And, uh, and you know, you're always searching for these things. And every once in a while, you find something cool, right? Absolutely. You catch them all the time. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So look forward to trying this one. We'll get back to you in just a second. But there's another person I want to introduce as well from Heaven Hill, Mr. Jack Cho. Jack, how you doing, man? I'm doing real well. Real well. How are you, Steve? Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be fun. we are use you for some of the historical stuff and just kind of talk and feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, you don't necessarily have to. We, we may rely on you, you know, brand history yeah. and things like that. Anything you can add to supplement the things that Wes has, we'd love to certainly hear that. And that's the kind of knowledge that uh, that we're into. A bunch for of sure. uh, well, whiskey I, I will say I, I'm really excited. I've never had any of the pre-fire mellow corn before. So that being said, being that I am a huge fan of it as is, Everyone should not be afraid to try the current day mellow corn as well, since yes. that pre-fire stuff is definitely not easy to find, as well. I'm sure we'll find out from Wes here in a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you work with the great Bernie Lovers. So what's that? I like? do work with the great Bernie Lovers. It's a joy. It's a joy every minute, every day. Today is his birthday. Yes. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. he, is out, he is out celebrating and I'm filling in his stead. <laughs> I'm Bernie and I are a team of two. Uh, yep. I'm usually based out in San Francisco, but um, I am in short sleeves, shirt sleeves today because I'm in Florida. Uh, after seven years of living in San Francisco, my wife and I decided we needed to sweat for a summer. So we are in Florida. Oh, nice. And I'm sitting outside, listening to the bugs and <laughs> right on the inter intercoastal waterway, loving it. And excited to sip on some corn. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, welcome and thanks for being here. We really appreciate you doing this. I think it really adds a lot to what we're doing. We'll also have some a sure. Q and A at the end for the audience, so they'll feel free to ask anything about Mellow Corn, Heaven Hill, the bourbon industry, or stuff like that. We'll get to that in just a bit. With that, cool. I'd like to turn it over to Wes Harden to kind of get into some of the history before we get to tasting this whiskey. All right, thanks, Steve. So, I, I, what I want to do is before we get into Mellow Corn specifically, um, I want to get into a little bit of history of just corn whiskey in general. I want to talk about uh, what kind of separates corn whiskey from bourbon and America, other American whiskey. So I'm going to start with a, a little bit of corn whiskey history. So late 1700s, people started settling into uh, what's now Kentucky and Tennessee uh, from the East Coast, mainly Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia. Uh, and in those days, when, when you settle, most people start farming, they're settling near a water source, uh, and they're looking to grow crops. And they've found this, you know, this great American crop, uh, especially in the South, corn, it's a great climate, perfect climate for it. Uh, and they start uh, growing corn, and they find out they've got excess. And so uh, the best way to deal with the excess is they learn from their ancestors uh, from Europe, and they eat to steal the corn. And what they find out is uh, when you distill corn and you consume it as an alcoholic beverage, it's, it's actually really sweet uh, and people like it. So they start uh, distilling this excess corn for trade and consumption. So, you know, the, the initial corn whiskey was unaged. It's just, it's corn whiskey. It's uh, white dog, as you would call it, and, and moonshine and so forth. Uh, you know, they, they used power, uh, water powered grist mills. Uh, this allowed the farmers to grind down the corn grains for distillation. Uh, and once they they started trading via longer distances than locals, they started using the rivers, obviously. Uh, and corn whiskey started getting uh, transported uh, to the various port towns along the major rivers, uh, the Ohio into the Mississippi are one of them. Uh, you know, one of the, the first trading ports along the Ohio uh, was in Maysville, Kentucky, which is... Uh, the home of Old Pogue Distillery, uh, which we'll hopefully deal with in a, in a future 
uh, dusty event. And then you get into Louisville, you go on down the river, you end up in uh, St. Louis. Time for hey, Steve. St. Louis. Plug. Yes, time for Steve <laughs> to plug St. Louis. I had to get that there. And then you start going around the bend and, and you eventually end up in New Orleans. Uh, so to, you know, to transport this whiskey, uh, they start uh, putting these in barrels. And so the longer the trek goes, the more time and the more movement and, and you run into the different climates and this, this, uh, this corn whiskey, this raw corn whiskey starts taking on some of the flavors of just a, a normal barrel. We're not talking about a bourbon barrel. We're talking about a barrel. Uh, and it starts imparting some of the flavors from the barrel. And so now you get the sweetness and kind of the rawness of the corn whiskey, but you're starting to impart some of uh, the flavors of the barrels. And then you get a little further down, uh, down the, uh, the timeline. And there's, there's 10 different stories of who first came up with it. But at some point, someone decided, you know what? I don't want to make new barrels all the time. I've got these uh, excess salt barrels and pork barrels and pickle barrels and vinegar barrels. And I could reuse those things to put my whiskey in, but I don't want all those crazy flavors in it. So let me burn the insides of these barrels and sterilize them is what it really, that was the original intent. Uh, and then once they do that, that kind of takes you into the bourbon realm. But as far as, as far as this goes, the, the history, corn whiskey was the original American uh, non-rye based whiskey for lack of better term. So that, that's the, you know, it's, it's always one of those scenarios. We, we never probably would have had bourbon, at least not as far back as, you know, 1800s, we would have never had bourbon without having corn whiskey first uh, for those reasons. So that, that's kind of a, just a very quick uh, kind of introductory type of lesson into to corn whiskey. I'm sure Bernie, he obviously tells a much detail, a more detailed story, but uh, that, that is corn whiskey. Uh, as far as what corn yeah. whiskey is today. Oh yeah, go ahead, Jack. Jump yeah, in. I would just add in, you know, speaking of, of what Bernie would say, I mean, I would just add in what we, what we do at, at Heaven Hill and what we talk about at Heaven Hill is very similar to exactly what you just said, Wes. And, you know, we're big on talking about the history and heritage of American whiskey and who, who has brought us where we are today. And, you know, very well said, you know, no one was really writing anything down. Nobody knows who's the first yeah. to use charred barrels. Um, and, you know, when we were talking about Evan Williams, we're talking about the man who was making whiskey in Kentucky in 1780, what is now Kentucky in 1783 is Kentucky's first licensed distiller. And he was make he was not making bourbon, as you said, you know, he was making unaged corn whiskey. It wasn't in the in the terms of our our brands and the stories we tell. And again, like you said, there's 10 or 12 guys that get credit for using the first charred barrel. And who knows if it was Elijah Craig or not. But um, that's that's how we talk about the father of bourbon. And exactly right. You know, he burned out the inside of some barrels that nine month trek down the Ohio uh, to the Mississippi down in New Orleans, where those folks um, supposedly maybe started calling it Kentucky bourbon whiskey for the for the first time. So, yeah, it really wasn't until the, or close to the the turn of the 19th and the 20th century that what we know today as bourbon really came to be. And we, uh, we are nothing without uh, corn whiskey from the, as the base to stand on. So. Absolutely. One thing I love about Bernie is, you know, he's definitely a company man. He's a heaven Hill guy and, and he's true to it, but I, I give him credit and I respect uh, bourbon industry people that also tell stories as truthfully as possible. And it's very, it would be very easy for him to jump on the one segment of the bourbon origin story and go down the Elijah Craig path. I mean, it makes total yep. sense. Right. But he actually doesn't, he, he doesn't think that that's the story. If you listen to him tell the history of bourbon, uh, he, he actually goes, he leans more towards the side of, you know, it simply was to sterilize barrels that were used for something else. And they found something amazing when they did it, but it was honestly, somewhat by accident, but purposely for, uh, they wanted to store their whiskey and they didn't want it tasting like salt and pickles and pork and vinegar fish. and whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fish exactly. and the whole nine fish. yards. So, that's, yeah. fish and yeah, one, one, one thing I love. We go with. Right. Yeah, one, one, of the, one of the things. Purchasing barrels from Mr. Broadhead's general store down in, you know, what is now downtown Louisville and, and getting them on the Ohio river and getting them down, yep. get them down South. Most of them we're going to that market of New Orleans, which which you meant, which you mentioned, and definitely Steve stopping. St. Louis, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Louis. You, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta make a stop in St. Louis. Yeah, all crazy stop in St. Louis. <laughs> all crazy <laughs> stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, all, all hail St. Louis. <laughs> yeah. I've actually only been to St. Louis once, and I spent the night in the airport because I got redirected after a bad oh, summer okay. thunderstorm in the Rockies. Those uh-huh. couches at the Starbucks, right when you get into the terminal, are uh, quite comfortable. Oh, so sure. there you go. There you go. Exactly. Well, next, next, to, time, next time you I get, call get over Steve, there. he can put you up. Yeah, there you can you stay at my place. I, I, I'm actually working on a bourbon room at my house that I call, we're, my wife and I are calling the Airbnb. It's really, we're not going to rent it out to anybody because we don't want strangers there. But, you know, people from the bourbon industry, sure. You guys want to come by? There you go. It's, well, it's perfect, free. Because I, it's, it's I free. always, yeah. I, when I travel, I always travel with bourbon. So there yeah, you go. There you go. Yes. And corn whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. I'm, I'm low on all that stuff at my house. No, not really. I have a lot of whiskey. If you come here, <laughs> I was going to call, I was going to call your bluff on that. But <laughs> yeah, anyhow, yeah. Wes, carry on. I, I interrupt. Oh, no, there. no. That's why you're here. It's perfect. Throw in a couple of things. Yeah. So before we get into specifically mellow corn, I, I do want to talk a little bit about what today is, what, what, what constitutes corn whiskey versus because it is defined. Some there of these things defined. we do, some of yeah, the things absolutely. we do aren't defined. Like you do moonshine, it's not defined. Corn whiskey That's is right. defined though. Well, Cor- so. Absolutely. Corn whiskey is defined. So here, here's the corn whiskey laws, as I like to call them. Uh, the mash bill must be 80% or more corn, period. Yes. It has to be not only uh, not only the, the large amount, the dominant uh, grain in the mash bill has to be 80% or more of corn. Uh, it's uh, distilled higher than 160 proof. Uh, it could be aged in uncharred barrels or used barrels. So that's a key. So there's a drastic difference in aging a white dog in an in a uncharred or an untreated barrel, just a raw barrel versus an X bourbon or an X whatever barrel. So that, that, that you have both of those options. Once it is aged in a charred new oak container, then we all know it falls into the bourbon. Realm. It has to be called bourbon at that point. It has to be that's called a- bourbon. That's what I was gonna. I was gonna say it doesn't reference barrels. Actually, it references what you yeah. just said. Oak yeah, containers. Yeah. yeah, I'm still waiting for the day when someone comes out with a container in mass. With an oak container, it's not a barrel. <laughs> it's not a barrel, right? <laughs> right. I know, right? Uh, for, um, forward thinking, they were thinking ahead of themselves. They were like, somebody's gonna invent a big some oak container that isn't yeah. round and easy to roll. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be a big oak wagon wheel. It's gonna we're be really we're weird. still waiting. We're still waiting on that to happen. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, can't go into the barrel any higher than 125 proof, and it has to be bottled at no less than 80 proof. So that's the right. general corn whiskey rules. It doesn't matter if you're making it uh, in Kentucky from Heaven Hill, you're making it uh, in Iowa, you're making it anywhere else in the U.S. Those are the minimum uh, rules. And, and Wes, I, I think it's it's cool to point out, too, I think when people think corn whiskey, they think it means it's, it has to be 100% corn. But like you said, right. Only eighty percent. So I, I only eighty percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're we're gonna give a uh, we're gonna give a good example of that. So, and, and Jack can jump in here anytime. For mellow corn from Heaven Hill, their mash bill is eighty percent corn. So it's right there on that uh, minimum corn requirement. Twelve percent uh, malted barley and eight percent rye. So we all know uh, through our vast uh, readings and teachings and seminars and classes of. Uh, of bourbon, we know that rye is obviously a flavor grain, and for the most part, the malted barley there is to ignite enzymes naturally, or yeah. and, and get the fermentation process going without having to add a ton of enzymes. So, that is the yeah. mellow corn mash bill. That's that's cool, and I think uh, Jack, you probably hear this all the time. I, I always hear people say mellow corn is one hundred percent corn, and now, now not people like you. I'm yeah. just talking about fans in general. They, they, I, they, I always they thought think that. Yeah, no, this, I mean, this is this is fun for me. I mean, usually I, I usually I'm the one that these gets to talk about the rules <laughs> and the regulations, and I like the fact that Wes is taking that over for me. Yeah, uh, that I would say that nine and a half times out of ten, if I'm talking about corn whiskey, people are like, oh yeah, so one hundred percent corn, right? I'm like, right. no chance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, you, you talk about you talk about the rules and the regulations and specifically the standards of identity, which I was actually looking into today because it sounds like they're finally starting to have the serious conversations about putting standards of standards of identity into place for American single malt whiskey. Uh, but that's nice. probably six, nine, 12, 18, 24 months down the line before that okay. actually comes to be. Um, but um, it is basically the same regulations as bourbon except for those two slight differences minimum 80 percent corn and if you're going to age it it's a it's got to be a used barrel that's already aged another type of whiskey 
uh, American whiskey or an uncharred barrel or, or not aged at all. Because when you look at mash bills and you make the comparisons, Evan Williams or our HH regular mash bill um, is 78% corn, 12% malted barley, 10% rye. So it's a very, very, very slight difference and you know, mellow this this beautiful bottle that we're going to be talking about, or that we're talking about, and going to be tasting some, has become pretty popular um, in the ter- in whiskey circles, especially during the pandemic. There's a subreddit thread that did not exist before March fifteenth, two thousand twenty, and now I think has so over something like ten thousand members or so. So it's it's we've we've Bernie and I've been doing a lot of these tastings and um, tasting. Evan Williams bottled in bond because of course mellow corn is bottled in bond and then our Rittenhouse rye bottled in bond. So basically three different bottled in bonds all at the minimum for a four year age. And those, those two that are so close to each other. So you can see where, where the corn is and then where that, um, that new charred Oak container really imparts that much more color and the different flavors that you get. I mean, you talk about mellow corn, you talk about the flavor profile, I, I refer to it as corn pops whiskey. Um, yeah. I'm 42 years old and I, I still at probably once a year grab a box of corn pops um, from the grocery store aisle. And the first time I had mellow corn seven or eight years ago, that was my initial exclamation was, oh my God, corn pops, corn pops whiskey. So it, it's fun to look at mellow corn. It's mash bill. It's fun to open people's eyes to that only 80%. And um Another very large player in the whiskey space, the largest player in the American whiskey space, has the exact same mash bill as Mellow Corn, and that's made by a certain certain distillery with the same first name as me in Tennessee. 80, 80, <laughs> 80, 80, 12, 8. Never heard of them. I, don't know. I can't same. think of it. I can't think of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. John's distilling. I've never heard of. It. <laughs> yeah, that's that is my that's my given first name. So, yeah. Steve, I'd like to throw a little bit of a curveball, if it's okay, sure. what we normally do. Everybody looks really thirsty. What I'd like to do yeah. is I would like to sample number one first, and okay. then I'll go back and talk about this mellow corn specific history, and then we'll jump into number two, and then we'll compare and do some Sounds like a good it. plan. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. So, if everyone grabs their, uh, their bottle marked mellow corn one. And Jack, we do these blind and we don't reveal until the very end. We give everybody a chance to uh, okay. weigh in on their what their idea of what they're getting on the nose, what they're getting on the palate and the finish. And at the very end, we do a quick tally and see uh, how good or how poor we are at picking out what is what. Yes. You did a really good job of sealing mine in the mail. I cannot... That's, that's uh, I've learned I've learned lessons with these little Boston rounds. If you don't put a, a nice. plumber's tape or something on there, they will leak. You are a hundred percent correct. You are a hundred percent correct. Let me, I'm going to see if I have a knife here. Yeah, no worries. While you're doing that, let's open it up for everyone. And yep. uh, let's start getting some people's feedback on what they're getting on the nose, color, glass. What do you guys think on uh, option number one? Absolutely. Keep your mics open folks. Share what you're getting on nose. I'm going to hide my bottle of mellow corn so that it does not influence my <laughs> my stuff my thoughts you know it's really interesting while people are getting over their shyness um i'll tell a little story just sort of out in the out in the real world with mellow corn um you know heaven hill has really only been a player in the on-premise so the the restaurant bar scene really in this new bourbon renaissance we were primarily what people were picking up to take home to drink is what we like to say um, our whiskeys are what they're drinking at home because people know how good the whiskey is and, and what a great deal it is. And uh, so people were really, when people were really first starting to get introduced to Mellow Corn, where I was in San Francisco five or six years ago, I would get pictures sent to me of bottles side by side. And one bottle would look almost clear, whereas the other bottle would look like, you know, iced tea that had been sitting in a car for four hours and, and the ice had all melted in it to lighten it. And it's really interesting to think about that because what that is, of course, is the different barrel that was used in the different barrels that were aging the corn whiskey that would become mellow corn. So um, I thought about that while I was saying I need to put my bottle away. But sometimes in the case of mellow corn, no two bottles look alike because sometimes we'll use a barrel that maybe formerly aged Elijah Craig barrel proof. So 
had, we had whiskey sitting in it for 12 years. Sometimes it'll be a, an Evan Williams black uh, whiskey that became Evan Williams black. So, um, you know, the way, you know, we've mentioned Bernie, Bernie, one of big, one of Bernie's big references about mellow corn is it's like using the tea bag twice when you're making, when you're aging the whiskey that becomes mellow corn. Yeah. Yeah. What's everyone think of the nose? What kind of notes are we getting out of there? So Jack, I got a question. So what you're saying is these barrels are not the same barrels every time with the mellow yellow. Is that correct? Correct. So it's going to be, that was going to be one of my questions. What barrels did you, do you use for mellow corn? So, I mean, so Heaven Hill is the only American whiskey distillery that's distilling all of the types of American whiskey as defined by the U.S. standards of identity, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. But we are primarily um, distilling what we call our HH regular mash bill, which is our 78% corn, 12% malted barley, and 10% rye. So that becomes brands like Evan Williams, Elijah Craig, Henry McKenna, Fighting Cock, J.W. Dant, J.T.S. Brown, Heaven Hill Bottled and Bond. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. We're distilling that probably 27 to 28 to 29 days out of every month. And then the other two, three or four days out of every month, we're fitting in the old Fitzgerald distillate. We're fitting in our rye whiskey dis distillate. We're fitting in our wheat whiskey distillate and we're fitting in our corn whiskey um, distillate. The six that we make that if you guys are, are big fans of ours and follow, follow us, um, Parker's Heritage in 2015, we did do an American malt whiskey release. So I do like to say that we actually do six types of American whiskey, but still only five as def I guess malt whiskey is defined, um, just not single malt is defined. So primarily the long winded answer is it's more than likely HH regular barrels. Um, and you got to remember none of our barrels have a brand name on them. The barrels tell us what brand they're going to become. There are 63 warehouses holding over 1.9 million barrels. Um, throughout the, um, the greater Bardstown area. And actually Louisville now, we just started using barrels out of our Bernheim brick, brick warehouses in the last couple of years. Um, those, the way those barrels are aging, where, how, and why, um, the whiskey tells our tasting team of Mike Sani, Tony Godi, and Chris Briney what they're going to become. You know, Mike's been with the team for 42 years, so as long as I've been alive. Um, so he has a pretty good idea, you know, if it's coming out of Rick house, high floor five, Rick six, you know, he, he's, he's mm. probably pretty familiar with what has been bottled out of barrels from there previously, you know, in our Deetsville campus, people are very familiar with because <coughs> I just learned the, the reason not to do a tasting outside in Florida in the summer is that bug flew down my throat. Um, <laughs> the Deets. The Deetsville, our Deetsville Rickhouse campus, which we um, got when we acquired the T.W. Samuels brand, um, that was known as Parker's Honey Hole, right? That's where a lot of the, the, that's where the original barrels that became Evan Williams single barrel came out of. It's where a lot of Henry McKenna comes from. Um, I've had some great old Fitz barrels out of there. So the very long winded answer to your question really is it, it's sort of, you know, what's available, what's around, what have we been dumping? What of the other brands have been really popular and been getting bottled a lot of that we have barrels available? There was a there was a rumor um, at the beginning of COVID that we were going to be making a, distilling a lot more corn whiskey than previous years because y'all were thirsty. You know, Evan Williams and Elijah Craig was absolutely flying off of shelves March, April, May, June of 2020. And, you know, one of our biggest businesses outside of selling spirits is selling barrels to the different global markets, you know, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, Mexico for tequila, the Caribbean for rum, India, Japan for whiskey. And during COVID, that was a total moot point. You couldn't do any of that. So what are, you, what are we going to do with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of used barrels? And um, for a couple months, we were distilling a little bit more, more corn whiskey. But the, the answer to that question is basically what's available, what, what we're what's been what's been bottled and what we can use nice two, two I mean, questions jack do, do you do any uncharred barrels and the second question is well how long do you you actually leave it in the barrel so um the standards of identity say that it has to be either aged in a used or uncharred um a brand new 
a brand new barrel that's uncharred costs 250 bucks. Um, the way that Heaven Hill has been operating for since 1935 is we offer the best possible product at the best possible price. And the way that we do that is by being very, very efficient. So we are using entirely uh, X, X use barrels for mellow corn and it is bottled in bond. Um, and the, the bottled in bond act of 1897 requires that to be bottled in bond, the, the minimum age on the whiskey um, has to be four years or older. So for mellow corn, we, we meet the, we meet the minimum standards for sure. There could, there's definitely some older corn whiskey in, in our warehouses. Um, I know when Bernie first started uh, seven years ago, he tasted some uh, seven year old, or excuse me, 10 year old corn whiskey. And as he tells it, it tasted like uh, mellow corn. And he and our master distiller, Connor O'Driscoll just, just retasted that stuff at 17 years. And he said it was wildly different and very delicious. So we're sort of waiting with bated breath to see what what's going to happen. We'll do yeah. what we'll do. I, yeah. Your it's guess is sim- as good as mine, Steve. Yeah, it's very similar to like cognac aging, where yeah, uh, or, or armanac aging, where they if they if they go into a used barrel or they go into uh, just a brand new uncharred type of container. At seven, eight, nine, ten years, it's pretty good. But man, when you get into that 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, yeah. 19, 20, 20, where bourbon to me gets way too oaky uh, because of the charring and, and so forth, yeah. uncharred barrels, like that extra aging takes it to a whole different level. Yeah, I had a 20 year, uh, we were tasting uh, a 20 year old old Fitz versus a nine year old old Fitz yesterday or what's it, Thursday on Tuesday. And I, by far and away, prefer the nine-year-old over the twenty-year. Just too much, too much oak on it. And it, it's uh, funny you, you bring that up about the about cognac and then scotch getting into that fourteen, fifteen year. You know, when you're talking about aging, it's, it's you know people are are big on age statements in American whiskey now, and it really doesn't mean the same as as what people know age statements to be from scotch, right? Because the a barrel in the Caribbean ages for one month, which is the equivalent of three months of aging in Kentucky, which is the equivalent of a year in Scotland. So if you're, if you want to do some quick math, four years in Kentucky is equal to 12 years in Scotland. So one of my best buds in San Francisco is the, is the me for McAllen. And I'm like, all right, I'm ready to do a mellow corn versus McAllen 12 blind taste off and see who wins because um, it's got, there's some interesting similarities there when it comes to comes to aging and, and grain bills and et cetera, et cetera. So plus they use a lot of our X casks. Any, any American down. whiskey kill any American whiskey kills a scotch in my opinion. I'm, I'm not a scotch guy. So. Not either Beach. but it's definitely a thing. But uh yeah not not my thing though. So all right I want to hear from the I want to hear from the normal regular crew. You guys have been sniffing and drinking and sniffing and drinking. What are, what are you guys getting here? Well, on the I, nose, on the nose, Wes, I mean, I, interesting, complex. I mean, I got, I definitely got the corn. I also got, you know, some baked goods. I got some lemon in there. Yeah. I get a distinct fruit. Yeah. And it's probably from the rye is my guess. The rye, mm-hmm. the small amount of rye in the mash bill probably brings forward some of that sweet fruit, but yeah, it was, what was it expecting it? It was a very distinct, I get like a lot of cherry, almost like a cherry syrup. Yeah. Anything else on the nose? All right, let's on the taste. What do we got here? I get. Ooh, I get I, oops, uh, I went ahead and tasted already. I get sweet honey and juniper. Juniper? Yeah. Juniper, huh? Uh-oh. Okay. Uh-oh. Sweet honey is definitely is definitely what I get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Juicy fruit. You know, I had I had someone we, we were talking about mellow corn a few weeks ago, and um, you know, we started comparing mellow corn to rum. And I just can't get that out of my mind. I think it's, I think it's got such a chewy and jammy mouthfeel, similar to like a Bayesian or a good uh, Jamaican pot still rum. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the finish is nice. Sticks with you. I mean, it's, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Uh, what did you say, Bill? Juicy fruit? The old? No, I wouldn't mean. That was it. Who said juicy fruit? Somebody did say. Oh, okay. The I finish, heard someone the say. Finish for, the finish for Melicorn is way longer than juicy fruit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's true that's true like fruit strike gum is the shortest and juicy fruit next <laughs> all 
that's the first time I've ever been able to bring up juicy fruit in a whiskey tasting. And I'm going to, and now, I, now that's a goal for every, every time to see if I can Gosh. bring that up. We Hang used to talk us. about uh, circus, circus ca- uh, peanuts. Circus peanuts comes up a lot, uh, but there's a, a lot of chewing gum references in our, in our yeah. tastings, uh, juicy fruit and bazooka has been say bubble yum. Yeah. yeah. Uh, bubblicious grape and all this crazy stuff. So. Big league chew. Big league chew. Gosh. Yeah. So, um, Wes, do we, when do we get to know what year pre-fire the pre-fire one is? And... It's a very, it's a very, I'll reveal, I'll reveal it at the end. Okay. It's, cool. it, it's a, it's a 1990. It's not, uh, okay. it's not super old, but it's, it's, a, it's a well, that was, that was right around the time when we acquired the brand. So it couldn't have been, it can't be much too much, uh, too much older than that. Okay. No. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll oh, wait, come wait, wait, back. No, no, no. Oh, I told you incorrectly. I'm sorry. It's not. It's a 99, I believe. 99. Okay. I need to double check. I got to. Well, well, the fire. Uh... No, it couldn't be, yeah. be 99 because that's the fire was 96. So oh, fire yeah, that's, but that's, that's bottle, 89. not distill. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got you. Yeah. Got yeah, you. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Got you. Got you. So it was, so it was distilled the year before the year before the fire. Gotcha. Okay. Man, I'll, that... I'll, I'll, yeah, let me, I'll double check and look. I, I don't have the bottle with me right this second, but it's, cool. uh, it's in the nineties. It's uh, shit. I'll have to look and see. Go ahead, Steve. Keep on. Yeah. I'll, I'll find it. Yeah. Uh, any, anybody, uh, you know, flavor wise, anything you want to add, Rick, the legend himself, anything uh, you want to add to it? I don't have a whole lot to add. Okay. Mike, Mike, is this, is this anyone's first time having mellow corn? Nope. Cool. I've never had it before. Nice. Nice. It's great. I, I, love, I love smelling it. Yeah. It's got a great nose. Yeah. I Did love one. We love adding we love adding new citizens of the corn. <laughs> I heard good things why I signed up for this. It felt like a, a great way to get introduced to it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. You know, it's it's funny. I mentioned the first time that I had it was about eight years ago. Um and um you know, that was the first time that I that I saw sort of the split of um, uh, the way people experience mellow corn. You know, it's either uh, it's either what the and excuse my language, what the heck is that, or what the heck is that? Like hate it or love it, and um, usually that's when you pull the bottle out, right? Yeah. And it's like you know, no one is necessarily. Although maybe people would be winning design awards for this because what's old is, is new is new again, right? Um, so usually usually people go one way or the other when they see the bottle, and then once they taste it, you get just usually most of those people that were not happy about what the bottle looked like are just in love with it because that sweetness and that viscosity that I mentioned, and just that you know that nice that nice buttered popcorn, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I got my first bottle because it looked like a uh, Route 66 <laughs> hotel sign, and it said, oh, "Well, this has got to be fantastic." No, my yeah. Favorite. Well, the bottle the bottle was copyrighted in 1945. We have not changed it. And uh, Bernie and I joke that the day that they that the marketing team decides to change the bottle is our last day with Heaven Hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, my Walk favorite candle that I have at home is made out of a yellow corn bottle. Favorite lamp. Bottle. Oh, nice. Can- candle and it's great because once the once the candle burns down but behind the uh label it glows yellow real good oh that's, that's cool. awesome i love that that's cool all right so Wes, what do you, you want- do just you just jam a can <clears throat> a candlestick in the bottom uh, no have a have what? a friend that makes candles oh wonderful cool he's, he's got a candle guy yeah <laughs> I need a candle check, guy. check him out on Etsy. My big fat Greek candle. My big yeah. fat Greek candle. That's, him. That's, where, that's where everybody's old bottles go to. Empty bottles yeah. go to. Yeah. All right. Let's uh if no one else has any other notes, I want to go on to some of the mellow corn history. So mellow corn uh was born or created in 1945 by Medley Distillery uh, in Owensboro, which is now Green River. Uh, and eventually the brand was picked up uh, by Heaven Hill in 1993. Uh, we all know it's a bottle and bond corn whiskey and it's minimum four years old. 
Uh, Jack, I don't want to put you on the spot, but there's kind of a, a, a funny little quip or um, comment, I think, that Max, when Max was asked about uh, in 93, they were picking up a bunch of brands, uh, I think from United Distillers at the time. Mm. And there was, I think, and I don't know if you know this or not, but some of my research, evidently he had a funny response when they were asking, hey, you know, all these other labels, we have this mellow corn label. Uh, yeah. you have anything, you have any kind of uh, knowledge about what was said? or? Uh, yeah, you know, I just, I just heard that story for the first time last week. Uh, when Bernie told it on the Bourbon Pursuit podcast. Um, and it was basically, I, I'm going to totally botch it, but it was basically like, never heard of it. Sure, throw it in. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's, the, that's the punchline is he was like, yeah, yeah. sure. I, I don't know what it is, but sure, throw it in there. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's so funny, uh, you know, talking about how the popularity of it has grown over the pandemic. You know, we, we would definitely, if, if Bernie and I were in the company of, of other folks from the, from the team and they heard us talking about mellow corn, we'd always get this sort of like side eye, like, why are you talking about mellow corn? But now you, all you have to do now is just go on Instagram and we, we launched a mellow corn page on Instagram on, on April 5th, which we call mellow corn day because for April is the fourth month and the fifth day. So in honor of being founded in 1945, and it is definitely one of the most engaged Instagram pages um, that we have. And when we post about mellow corn on the Heaven Hill Distillery page, um, it definitely gets a fair number of uh, likes and, and interactions. So the, uh, the citizens of the corn are, are powerful and loud. Nice. Yep. So that's, uh, again, it was uh, acquired in 93. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that 93 number actually. So I learned something here tonight too. I've, I've always heard, you know, talking about no one writes anything down as far back as Elijah Craig and Evan Williams. It seems like no one was really writing anything down in the eighties and nineties <laughs> either when we were making a lot of acquisitions because yeah. as Max also likes to say, American whiskey was well on its way to the big liquor store in the sky. And had anybody had any sort of a crystal ball in 1993, when we acquired mellow corn, um, we would have been, we would have been putting a lot more barrels down in 1993 to be ready in you know 2013 14 15 and into now yeah it's uh the the 90s late 80s all the way through the 90s that's when uh, the big five dissolved decided they wanted out of the bourbon and american whiskey industry and started uh, selling off labels left and right in distilleries mm -hmm. and, and so forth and heaven hill wow uh picked up uh quite a quite a long uh, list of heritage labels including mellow corn so that's uh it's interesting uh you know you guys mentioned earlier the label is exactly the same today as it as it was in 1945 including the copyright so that's the key piece of uh information on there even the the, the copyright the whole nine yards the two bottles i have which one is a, a current production bottle and the other is the dusty, like the dusty's larger because it's a liter size. It was a common bottle back then. Um, but uh, the labels just spot on, just absolutely uh, exactly the same. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the history. He Heaven Hills had it since 93. Um, you know, the last dusty event we had, and I think most people that are on now were on then. Uh, we actually did a, I think it was J.W. Dant, uh, pre-fire versus regular and we went through not the history of JW Dance so much but the history of the fire at Heaven Hill in 96 and how the company recovered they purchased uh, the Bernheim facility so mm -hmm. you know, we are what we're sampling tonight we're sampling uh, for all intents and purposes a, a DSP uh, one uh, distillate uh, which would be Bernheim and a DSP 31 which was the original Heaven Hill distillery uh, that burned. So that's, uh, Jack, add anything to the history that's, uh, you know, mellow corn is one of those, they just kind of like, it's it's a little bit of a, corn whiskey in general is a niche uh, thing. Once people find yep. it, they love it. Uh, it's not, uh, it's just been consistent over the years. It's had two owners, which is pretty uncommon uh, with the turmoil that, uh, uh, if you think from 1945 till now, how much turmoil 
there's been in the industry and how many big labels have changed names two, three, four, five, sometimes six times. Right. You know, this, this little mellow corn label just kept on chugging and change hands one time. And uh, they're in the, they're in as good a hands as they could be in right now. I think. Going yeah. Forward. I mean, Med Medley had a number of different owners through the sort of the downturn of American whiskey until we, until we acquired this specific brand. And then of course now they're, they're back. Their family has gotten, uh, has gotten reactive over the course of the last five or six years um, and getting some of their, their brands out there. But yeah, there's, I was wondering sort of what to talk about with the history of mellow corn because they're, I mean, it's been around since 1945, which is what, 78 years or something like that. Right. I can't do math that quick. Um, but there really isn't that much. I mean, you want to talk about niche, like you said, I mean, corn whiskey is niche. There are, there are really only a handful of corn whiskeys out there. And when you talk about aged corn whiskeys, I mean, the two that own, that come up in the conversation most often are us and Balcones uh, Blue. And, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned moonshine earlier, you know, corn whiskey isn't necessarily moonshine and moonshine isn't necessarily corn, corn whiskey. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the tale of mellow corn is, is really only starting to, to show itself now, I think, in it's in its 78th year. And it's awesome just to see, just to see it grow. Um, and, you know, when you talk about the growth of Heaven Hill's whiskey portfolio and it's somewhat discombobulated, doesn't you know doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it's not like we were like all right let me think of all these different old labels that we could acquire and go get them they presented themselves to us you know they were available we were we you know max shapira came to join his dad and his uncles in the business in 1972 after being on wall street for a few years and going to harvard business school and you know what's the first thing that anybody's financial planner tells them when they sit down for that first meeting right it's diversify 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 and while other American whiskey distilleries were focused on trying to figure out how to sell that extra age stuff that they'd created in the 50s and try to figure out how to sell blended whiskey and light whiskey, et cetera, Heaven Hill was doing a little bit of that, but we were also working on acquiring, you know, vodkas and gins and being the, the distributor of record of Irish, Canadian, Scotch whiskeys, tequilas, whatever, whatever we could get our hands on to help build that bottom line and, and diversify and really build a broad portfolio which we still do today. You know, I mean, the heart and soul of Heaven Hill Brands, which is our, our corporate name, is Heaven Hill Distillery, right? But we wouldn't be alive. Heaven Hill Distillery wouldn't still be functioning if it wasn't for that full, that full broad portfolio that we have, which, you know, which makes us, I think we're the fifth largest supplier of, of distilled spirits in the United States. And we are the largest family owned and operated distilled spirits company in the U.S., which is, which is really cool. And, yeah, I mean, you look at you've you've mentioned a couple of them. I've said a couple of them. J.W. Jan, Dant, J.T.S. Brown, T.W. Samuels, old old Joe. Um, I'm just I'm trying to think through the whiskey label or through the through the label room in Bardstown. And if you ever get the opportunity to get out there, uh, Virgin and, Bourbon and, and a Virgin Bourbon. Yeah, Cabin yeah, Still, and, love, Anderson love County. Virgin I mean, Bourbon. there's a there's a there's a yeah, there's laundry so list. So of many dusty labels. Mm -hmm dusty bottles that are basically heaven hill from 67 really more 70s 80s 90s and early 2000s it's just like you can sometimes it's hard to decipher there's a website that has like a list of all of the yeah. heaven hill labels that you guys own and it's like this gigantic monstrosity of a list of, of and yeah. obviously not all are active on the market now but they were at one time and you know some were right. private label bottlings and so forth but yeah you guys own a ton yeah of labels so i've learned the other thing about doing a tasting outside in florida in the summer is the mosquitoes really like mellow corn i've got yeah. oh yeah one go. i've got one mosquito in number one and one mosquito in number two and they are both dead so speaking yeah. of that let's uh if you haven't already let's pour sample number two and let's start getting some feedback from the group here I think a mosquito in your drink is better than just one flying down your throat. So enjoy that. I guess. Like, yeah, that, that fortunately, that, fortunately, that one came back up. So we're good. Yeah. Although, yeah. you know, protein. My dietitian tells me I need more protein. So there we go. <laughs> All right. A little more corn on the nose on this one. Yeah. This one has a distinct flavor on the nose, and I can't pinpoint what it is. I'm gonna see if I can change my setup while we're while we're starting to nose this stuff. This almost has like 
I get like a cigar box smell almost. Cigar box. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe tobacco barn or you know, like something in that earthy realm. Okay. I, I don't get that. Uh, I don't get that sweet fruit. I don't get that lemon cherry, whatever right. you're getting on the nose on the other one. Okay. Right, let's give it a taste and see where we're at here. That's interesting. It's pretty darn good on the taste, isn't it? It is really good. Mm -hmm. Nice and sweet. I felt, like, I felt like number two is a lot lighter than number one. Yeah. On the mouthfeel, I'm not. I could. I couldn't see the color where I was. But more sort of resembling. More sort of resembling like a, the mouthfeel of a scotch as opposed to what I'm used to. Wes's has more of an oats taste to it to me. That, that's that flavor to me. Yeah, it does have a little bit of that. It's it's a the 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 first one to me was a little more I don't want to use the word vibrant because it makes it sound like it's so much better than the second one, but it was a little a little fresher tasting for lack of better terms. A little uh, I actually thought the first one had more lighter notes, it had kind of that fruit note, it had a little bit of that baked goods note. This one, to me, the nose, I got like that cigar box leather kind of note, which I don't get a lot out of uh, whiskeys on the nose. And then on the taste, to me, it's uh, I, I think the oatmeal is good. There's a little bit of spice there, which is probably coming from the rye content. But man, there's something on this nose that I just can't. Yeah, there's there's a there's a certain term that they use to describe scotch, and I feel like it's like that. Isn't it like iodine? Those ones. Yeah, that, that I'm, come I'm not from getting. Iowa. I'm not getting that. To me, it doesn't taste or smell like a scotch at all. Because I probably would have stopped at sip number one, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just a. It's a more earthy. To me, yeah. it's a little more earthy, a little more. Um, grain forward in a good way though all right this is crazy Wes. and i know one is current and i know one is vintage if you okay. set both of these down to me blind test i would not guess mellow corn on either of these really I, they're, they're both these very different than what in my mind is is mellow corn of today so it's it's going to be interesting to yeah make it, a call here and, and part of it is this is what i like about these tastings the blind yeah is a i love the blind part but even in in just one our group sets down, even if we're not comparing, we're just in, in our group, it's dusties. We're just tasting and sampling a dusty. It's always going to be different when you're sitting down with the purpose of deconstructing what your senses are telling you versus you're sitting on your back porch at night in front of the fire pit. And you're just sipping whiskey. You're probably going to get totally different. It's going to be different each time your senses yeah. are different there's a, a little bit of excitement and, and stuff going on. You're trying to figure out what you're tasting. And I, I think not having the bottle in front of you as well, it makes a difference yeah. too. I oh, mean, yeah. there's something Absolutely. that those, that those bright yellows, red and greens do to your senses when you're looking at that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you, Steve. I mean, I had, I was having mellow corn meat on Tuesday and I don't, these, both of these are not striking any, um, notes of memory yeah. in my head at all. Well, surprised they're both Platte Valley. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Platte Valley. <laughs> one, one thing about it to me is, so you, you were used to tasting these bourbons. This doesn't taste like bourbon. Yep, it no. doesn't have the mouthfeel of bourbon. This is just a, a total new critter for us. And, and I agree with you, Wes. This is, the second one is much more grainy. The OD. It, husky it has that husky yeah thing. it's more er, to me earthy is the earthy. only word i can yeah. come up with right. because exactly. a lot of people when you say oh a whiskey's grainy they first say oh it's young and it's you know it's, it's harsh Gra grain forward in the right way is one of the better flavor profiles out there in my opinion to me to me this has more flavor more i agree different distinct distinguished flavors i think this is more earth. unique than the number one yeah i, I agree with you it definitely it's, has it's, a longer finish. It does have a longer finish. 
it's like, you know, what's weird about the two is I get, you know, with, with rise, different rise, you have everything from the barely legal rye, like a Pikesville, which is sweeter, more bourbon uh, flavor profile, all the way to the infamous MGP 95.5. And they're not the only people making it, but they get the credit for it for whatever reason. And you have everything in between. And, and in that spectrum of rye whiskey, you can go all the way from heavy dill pickle, you know, type of notes all the way down to like cherry bomb fruit forward explosion and in, anywhere in between. Yep. Uh, and, and so like, I think the rye content comes out differently in both of these. The first one, I think that's where the fruit flavor comes from is the rye. But in the second one, I think the rye gives you that, that, that finish and that little bite on the end. And it's more of a rye spice versus a fruit type of rye. I think you get, I think you get more grain. I think it was on the nose on the first one and then more fruit on the nose on the second one. I'm trying to remember. Nose on that. the second one has me baffled. I'm kind of intrigued by it, to be honest. I just, I was just nosing going back and forth. And the first one, the alcohol content absolutely like rocked my, rocked me on the first one. Yeah, I still go back to, tobacco leaf cigar box news on the on the second one i just can't get my head wrapped around that yeah. what about uh we got a we haven't heard from a lot of different people uh anybody else have any ideas getting anything that we're not getting warner what are you thinking as you, you taste now that you've tasted both of them what are your thoughts uh well i have to say i preferred mellow corn one okay. uh, he likes one Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, th I thought, you know, I, I liked them both, but, uh, you know, I think the, that I, I, I had the exact same difficulty, like putting my finger on that distinctive, you know, taste or taste. And also you get it a lot on the nose of, uh, mellow corn too. And yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I just preferred, preferred one. Okay. Anyone else before we take a vote? Any anything you want to add, flavor wise, comparison wise, anything like that? I'm enjoying drinking both of them. <laughs> does, does anybody not like either one of them? Just curious. I like them both. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I guess number two gets a little more. You know, it's a little closer to that classic kind of bourbon from okay. me going on. And number number one is definitely. Corn whiskey, no doubt about it. Number two is kind of tied in there. If you put this up against, you know, if you blinded this and applied a bourbon, it'd be hard to hard to sniff it out. So I think that that flavor profile that I'm trying to put on for number two is like that band, like that band aid, like is it band aid or bactine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I guess is what you're describing as earthiness, West. Uh, Mellow Corn 2. But I also it, don't hate that. Yeah, after the first few sips, it definitely grew on me. The first one, I was I was kind of like, whoa. But uh, definitely grew on me. You kind of, I don't know, and that's how it was for me. I got, I got used to it, and I like it. But I still prefer one. Steve, you think we're ready to vote here? Uh, let's, let's have a couple other people weigh in. Emily, what are you, what are your thoughts here before we get to the official vote? What, what are your, what are your thoughts as we, as we head towards that? I thought number one was kind of what I would refer to as a zing. So it kind mm -hmm. of gave right off the um, bat, but, um, actually I thought two was a more smoother taste that I actually kind of prefer. So, but I like the zing of one is what I okay. would call it. Okay. All right. All right, Tom. How about you? As you're as you're tasting through those, any any thoughts or anything like that? Um. Yeah, actually, I really like them both. Uh, I got a little more alcohol on the nose on number two, a little more alcohol on the palate on number one. Uh, but I thought number one was uh, the thing that really st stood out to me was it was uh, just like real creamy. Uh, a real creamy mouthfeel. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't kick either one of them out of bed. Okay. All right. All right. The team Maces, we got uh, 
Nate, we'll ask you first, and then we'll talk to Nick. Well, I thought um, number two seemed to me sweeter and like more full than number one. I, I mean, I wouldn't describe number one as flat, but I think in comparison to number two, that's kind of how I felt about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nick, how about you? See, I was going to kind of say the opposite, but now I think maybe I just switched the bottles. Uh, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I'm having a hard time like remembering which one I poured in which one. Don't go by whatever I said. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, no, no. So I, I, I thought I, I agreed, I think, with the Tom, I guess, the previous comments. I thought the there's definitely a different mouthfeel between the two. I, I thought that, you know, the first one, um, definitely more fruit flavors. I kind of got a, like a melon, like a honeydew or a, something like that. It, it reminded me kind of of the, you know, like the smell of a rind of um, a cantaloupe or, you know, something like that. Um, which I, I definitely didn't get with the second one. It was definitely more of the leathers, tobaccos, that sort of thing. Um, and more of the, the, you know, alcohol on the, on the nose. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I preferred the, the first one, but they're definitely um, kind of very different creatures. Okay. A little bit of fun trivia, then we'll, then we'll vote here, Wes. Uh, All right. I don't, I don't know if you saw uh, Lily. I don't know if you follow her on Instagram, but she did this post. She lives in Australia. Okay. Earlier this week, she paid 76 Australian dollars for that bottle, which I looked up. I thought, well, what's that, what's that even mean? Uh, 57 bucks in Australia. Wow. Uh, equivalent to US dollars, 57. That's that's quite high. Heaven Hill's uh, making a killing in Australia. They're, uh, they're killing it when they send that <laughs> over. It's all going to go to Australia, I think, at this point. Those taxes uh, are a little. The taxes are a little much over there. Best so. deal in the world. Don't feel too, best don't deal feel world. too good for us. <laughs> don't feel too good. Don't be too, en- don't be too envious. <laughs> Jump in a car and head to St. Louis, a little town uh, outside of St. Louis called DeSoto. They sell mellow corn. I don't even know how they do this. I, we had Bernie on an event, and I asked me, he's like, I think they're losing money on this. Six dollars and ninety-five cents. Wow, how's that they're possible? De- they're, they're definitely <laughs> losing money. That's but the man, best. That's the best deal in whiskey, right there. Six ninety-five. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, holy! Bell so for the people. Bell accord for the people. So there you go. So that's that's your range: six ninety five in Desoto, Missouri, or, or fifty seven dollars <laughs> US in in Australia. So to pick it up, pick it up in the uh, Desoto, then head to Australia if you're going to go there. Yeah, very cool. All right, Wes, I think it is time to vote. Let's have them vote on two things. Right. Number one, what do you think is the vintage offering? And again, it's just number one or number two. You tell us what you think is the vintage and then tell us which one you liked better. It doesn't have, it can be the same one, but it doesn't have to be. So we're going to find out two things. What does everyone think is the vintage one? We're going to find out also what their favorite is in terms of a sipper. And uh, Wes, you can just call people out and, uh, and have them vote whatever order you like. All right. I'm going to start at the top of my screen. I'm sorry if it's not the same as everybody else, but Nate Mace, you're up first. Two for both for me. I two like, for both. I okay. like two, and two is the you think two is the vintage and you liked it better. Okay. Fair enough. Who's next? Robert Mace. All right. Do that. Same thing. Okay. All right. He gives the ditto. Okay. All right. Uh, on? Let, let's, let's, uh, I'm going to leave Jack for last. I'm going to skip Jack for now. Okay. Yeah, they Mike- want to do want to leave everybody, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, we're gonna go to Mike Gas Camp right now. Okay, I'm um, I'm gonna go double deuce also. Double, double deuce, deuce, it is. The double All deuce right. has jumped out to the lead. It. I, this is a tough one though. So uh, the, the other ones we've done, we done Dusties and that. I I felt pretty strong. I don't feel very strongly about this one. I you know I'll, I'll be voting too, but later. But go ahead, right. Who, who's let's next? let's let the legend weigh in. All right, the legend. Twenty two. Twenty two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Right. Let's, uh, let's Everyone's pretty to, confident. Everyone's feeling the same yeah. way here. Let's go to the godfather of the Mace clan, Kent Mace. Kent Mace, okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to break a little bit here. Okay, good, good. I like that. The interesting part about this is, so I, I've been sipping on both of them, and I don't know if you can see, the thing about it is I've drank a whole lot more of number one. Uh-huh. Then I have number two. Okay. Okay. Are you there or did I freak? No, we're, we can. We can see it. So. We can see it. 
Are you there? I, I froze up. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good, you're good, man. Okay, so I've drank a whole lot more of number one than I have number two. I do find number two a lot more complex to me. So, but I've got to go with the fact that I've drank a lot more of number one. So I'm, I'm going to go number one just number because one. I agree with Steve. They're, they're both right both there good. to me. Yeah. So, so Kent, your favorite is number one. Is it, do you, do you think number one is also the vintage or do you think the vintage is number two? Now we lost it. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll come back and get his uh, vintage. Which one's older dad? Which one do you think is the older one, Kent? I think number two is the oldest. Number two. Okay. Okay. That's what, that's kind of what I thought because he was talking about it, you know, more complex and all that. But yeah. I didn't want to. I didn't want to speak for him, so uh, I'm glad he weighed in and, and did that. All right, Wes, who's next? Go with Tom. Tom. Uh, that's great. I'm gonna go. My favorite is number one. Uh, okay. By a, by a pretty good by a pretty good step, and uh, just based on the the color and the mouthfeel, I'm gonna say number one's the dusty as well. Okay. 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 All right. Next is going to be a Warner. Warner. All right. Uh, yeah. So I agree with uh, Kent. I was, I was thinking the same thing. You know, um, about, you know, obviously I said I preferred number one, um, but you know, number two just has this characteristic that you know every other Dusty I've had seems to have, which is this like, you know, it just has like the flavor bomb really long finish and it's just like they don't make them like they used to it seems like so i'm gonna say my preference is number one but okay number two is the dusty number two is the dusty okay gotcha all right the infamous mr bill is on deck so i think that um number two is the dusty okay and number one is my favorite okay guys we have tied it up uh, we started out number two was up four nothing in the favorite. It is now tied four apiece. Uh, so that's interesting. The, the vintage people are still guessing uh, the vintage being number two, but we've tied it up uh, favorite flavor. So that's that's pretty cool. All right, let me check my screen. I feel like we're missing. It's something. like a it's like a Braves Cardinals game, Steve. I'm a Braves yeah. fan. You got yeah. you seem to go out it's and you guys Emily. Yes. Emily, there we go. I couldn't. She was right on the right. You got to root for the cards in that matchup, by the way. Sorry about that, Emily. You are the your potential tiebreaker here. Well, I've learned to not trust my intuition. So what my intuition <laughs> tells me go opposite of that. So number two will be the the dusty, and I'm a number two fan as well. Yeah, she takes the George Costanza Costanza do the opposite approach. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Steve, I think that leaves you, and then we'll get uh, Jack last. Okay. Uh, I went with uh, what a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the votes were two, two. And that's what I said too. I said two, two. Okay. I thought two was the vintage and I liked two better. So that was my vote two, two. Right. Jack, you're the, you're the, you're the heaven hill guy. You're uh, you're uh, Bernie lovers, right-hand mellow corn, man. We're going to put <laughs> you to the test and you drink this stuff a lot. Let's see what you think. I do. And I've never, <clears throat> I haven't had a taste profile like number two. So I immediately thought that two was, was the dusty. So I think I'm going to stick with that. Okay. Um, and I've, re I really have waffled back and forth between <laughs> if two is my favorite and one is my favorite. I think, I think from sort of an esoteric, like, Hey, try this too, definitely. But I think from sitting around, I think Wes said it earlier, sitting around the campfire and my, the fire pit in my backyard, I think I would prefer to have one. So plus you like your job, right? And... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> plus, All you right. Like, plus you like your job. Right? You gotta keep that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so so Wes, right. here here's the totals before you reveal what's what. Okay. I want to I want to give you the grand totals here. So it ended up being uh 10 votes. Uh, thought number two was the vintage we did have one say number one was the vintage one okay and then we we ended up being of course very I close on the favorite that it was six to five on the favorite number two ends up being the favorite of the group by one vote uh number number one had five votes number two had six votes so very close on the favorite but uh kind of a runaway people are saying that the vintage is number two but you have to tell us yeah so we we've uh we've had quite a few of these events uh in this dusty series uh, and, and a lot of, uh, and I, I want to thank everyone. And we have a, a core group of people who seem to uh, enjoy the Dusties and they join everyone. So we're starting to get a track record of 
you know, people are starting to, to get pretty savvy with these guesses of what's what. Uh, so two things held true. We talked about the consistency of mellow corn through the history and so forth. And I think the, the favorite between one and two being so close kind of proves that, uh, you know, through the years, it's been fairly consistent. I mean, we obviously yeah. had different flavor profiles off each, uh, each dram, but ultimately um, it's not like today's mellow corn was drastically worse than the, the, the pre-fire or vice versa. It was almost an even split. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that kind of goes back to some of that consistency we've talked about uh, with that product um, since it's been with Heaven Hill specifically, but you guys hit it uh, dead nuts. Number two is the dusty. Yeah, we've done it. We did a nice group work there as always. Yep. We busted it and, uh, and you know, we got it. So very good. Jack and, can keep his job now. He, he knows he <laughs> understands mellow corn very well. He picked it out perfectly. So yeah, Jack was great. So he really added a lot to this. So Jack, thanks for being part of this, man. Really. I got to get, that. I got to get the ad, them to add that to my KPIs. Though, I, guess. <laughs> uh, I no, will say this. Interesting. We've, we've had a, the tasting notes we have for mellow corn. I'm not sure how long we've had them, who, who we had do them for us, but, the last line of that tasting note is similar to Bayesian rum. And uh, hmm. this dusty is, I mean, the more and more I have it, I, um, I think it was Kent. I, I noticed that he had poured out his entire samples. I generally only have a little bit of, of the samples and events like this, but I, I saw that he had emptied, emptied both his bottles out. So I followed suit and emptied mine and have just been sitting here sipping it. And I Enjoying get it, those. Yeah. You know, I, I still get that like Band-Aid thing at the front, but it finishes so sweet and juicy um, at the end. So it, it's been this has been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, Wes, I do have to know where you're from, though, because my my mother's maiden name is Harden. I'm from, I'm from a little town called Russellville in southern Kentucky, around Bowling okay. Green area. So okay. I live in Louisville now, but I'm from southern Kentucky. OK, so. Yeah, I mean, my I'm, my family's from Georgia, but we were all up and around those parts too. And that's also the name of the new the new bottle that I think Jim Beam is putting out from there. Hardens uh, Creek. Yeah, we uh, Creek, right? we uh, we had an event. Uh, and we had uh, Freddie No on. We were doing a Dusty event uh, with a really old Dusty Bookers, and uh, we were talking about that. And he kind of uh, he kind of breached that information on the show, which is exciting. I'm excited about it personally obviously sure so. sure yeah yeah makes some sense yeah my my uncle owns a bar in augusta georgia and he was like i'm sure as shit getting a couple bottles of oh absolutely I, like, yeah. I get it i get it i get it yeah, yeah. very cool Jack, uh, Jack, i'm a big fan i i i'd never tasted the belly yellow before uh, I, i'm, I'm mellow, mellow corn <laughs> I, I, you got yourself know, messed up when you're talking about mellow yellow soda yeah, earlier yeah it is yeah it is I, so i i am a big fan now and i will be following so I thank you for, for offering and uh, good stuff. Hey, my pleasure. Good and stuff. I will tell you, there, there are a number of bars throughout these great United States who have a boiler maker offering on their menu called a Mellow Yellow, which is a shot of Mellow Corn and a Miller High Life um, or some other Pilsner or, a lager, or light lager similar. So um, yeah, that's one, of the, that's one of the things that my research came up with that uh, bartenders, uh, mixologists, cocktail uh, bartenders are starting to use mellow corn in a lot of their cocktails because it imparts a totally different flavor profile, but you can still offer it to the whiskey fan who's not wanting to to, to drink yep. neat bourbon all night long or neat whiskey or whatever. And it's it's becoming more yep. and more popular as a kind of an oddball, different profile offering with the mixologist. So that was an uh, interesting yeah. piece of information. Bernie's Bernie's like favorite it. cocktail is a is a Paloma with mellow corn. So sub out the tequila uh, with mellow corn. Um, mine, I, I enjoy a Boulevardier with mellow corn, um, which isn't straying too far. Um, I, and then the one that I heard the other day was a daiquiri. So sub the rum oh. for mellow corn. I haven't done that yet. But, that would be uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, it it makes sense. That now. Yeah. For it to be so hot in the bartender, yeah. because of course it's a cheap product too. So, but it's good. It's flavorful, can make some great drinks with it. So it makes sense. Inex why be, inexpensive. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, inexpensive. But yeah. It, it has um, in, in my travels, it has supplanted Fernet Branca as the bartender's handshake, if you will. And even Rittenhouse in some cases, you know, especially as it's distribution and love has grown. So for sure. Yeah, it is. It is 
the, the citizens of the corn are 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 shining through. Children of the corn. That's a good deal. Uh, Wes is back. Sounds awesome. It does. Yeah. Get DeSoto, if you're going to be heading through town, uh, get 695, pick it up. So uh, amazing <laughs> yeah. deal. Uh, ne- Wes's next event is next dusty one. Oh, of course he's got one coming up next week, but that is, uh, that one is the tickets are no longer on sale. So, uh, the next one where it, they are for sale is July 7th. He's going to be doing Canadian club, same type of thing. Ooh. He's going to be doing an old dusty versus today's offering. We'll do the same thing we did here. We'll go through. It's a nice value, uh, offering it's, really a, a cheap event and of course we send you the whiskey and all that kind of stuff so check it out seven seven i'll include a link i will be emailing you guys after this because i always email out with a recording of this so for those that missed it and i have to send it through the eventbrite system but that way they can uh, check out the video if they if they missed the live event which some people did so hopefully they'll go through and cool. do a blind tasting on their own um uh, one thing i wanted to throw out there too uh, i saw this online today jack i don't know if you've heard of this uh, it's called hot corn. You, you take uh, two, two products. You take mellow corn and you take old granddad 114, 50% of each. So you put two together and then you, you blend them, you mix them up, and then you let it sit for, for 24 hours. And, and supposedly it is a really nice whiskey when you, when you do that, uh, do that split. So I don't know. I what, haven't heard of that. I, I have both bottles. I'll, I'll give it a try. I thought you were going to say like mellow corn and and fire water bitters. I did hear about that. Oh, oh really? Okay. No, 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 this one's, this one's OGD 114, which is pretty cool. That, that one was dubbed the great cornholio. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Before yeah. we wrap this one up, I want to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, you know, it, obviously we have Wes, you can ask any questions about Dusty's about this event, anything you want to ask him myself, you know, in the, in the bourbon world. And of course, Jack, you know, heaven Hill or just the bourbon industry. Any, anything anybody wants to ask? Hey Jack, I got a question. What is uh, uh what's what's your old newest product? Um, the most recent product release we had um, is two distillery only uh, products. We have it's called Five Brothers, which is uh, paying homage to the five Shapiro brothers that started Heaven Hill um, when Harry and Joe Beam came looking for a cash infusion to begin their new distillery in the right after repeal. Um, so that's, that's paying homage to those, those five gentlemen, Ed, Gary, George, David, and Mose. And that's available at the Bourbon Heritage Center. It's called the Heaven Hill Bourbon Heritage Center now. Um, and then Square Six, which is the first release of the whiskey that we've been distilling at the Evan Williams Bourbon Experience in downtown Louisville. And that is paying homage to Evan, the lot of land or the plot of land where Evan Williams had his first licensed distillery, uh, which was actually right across the street from where the present day Evan Williams bourbon experience stands. So cool. Very cool. What else? Anybody want to know? Good and then deal. if you're I... talking about oh. general market stuff, the barrel proofs are the probably the newest, the Larceny barrel proof. There you go. And Elijah, and Elijah Craig toasted barrel. Yeah, I think that's it. Jack, um, you guys have opened up uh, Elijah Craig barrel proof on the barrel program, correct? We have as of uh, three weeks ago, I think. Okay. It's yeah, I thought so. Pretty, pretty popular. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then Evan Williams 1783. We just relaunched that. Totally new bottle, new proof. It's, it's really fantastic. Good. It is. Uh, we've really had good. some delays. I, I'm not sure where everyone's located, um, but we've had some delays getting it out to market, but I believe it's everywhere now. It's, I mean, it is, I'm not just being company, man. It's yeah, fantastic. It's, I've, it's really I've gone through, I've gone through four bottles in, in eight weeks. And that is a, <laughs> that is a very, that is a, a good very clip. high clip. That is a yeah. very high clip for me. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Kent, did you have a question? I was going to say, um, and Jack, the, uh, across from across the road, the land that, that Evan Williams owned, there was a guy by the name of Shawhan. He was a distiller too, and his son ended up moving to Missouri. And I, the only reason I even know this guy or think about this guy, this is a guy that I end up doing a bunch of surveying on his land. You know, not too many years ago. But he mm-hmm. ended up buying a distillery, which is now McCormick in Missouri. Okay. His name was George Shawhan, but his dad or his granddad was the. Oh no! Oh, that was oh, good. That was so going to be a good one too. Oh, yeah. he's back. At the same time, they were all distilling together, so that 
when, when you're talking about Evan Williams in that time, it was, it was, it was, I, I think about stuff. Him. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's, I don't know if everyone's been to the Evan Williams bourbon experience before, but it's a pretty cool it's sort of a, my wife actually calls it bourbon Disneyland. She grew up or Disney world. She grew up uh, where we are now, very close to Orlando. And there's a cool video. And I like to, I wish I knew the story of all the other uh sort of board of trustees of the cre the creation of the town of Louisville in and around the 1780s and 1790s. It would be cool to know all those stories. So it's cool to at least know one other guy's or one other family's story for sure. Or, and even go further back onto before Louisville when it was Corn Island where General George Rogers Clark took that first group of settlers through the Cumberland Gap. And that's where corn really first started becoming distilled. But like we said, no one really wrote anything down there. So, yeah. yeah. Anything else? All right, I guys. I say, Jack, as a fellow Braves fan, the uh, Braves have no hit the uh, cards through six innings. <laughs> uh oh. Uh, and, and now it's three nothing Atlanta. So, <laughs> Tom Hawk oh. Chop, let's get it on. No, no. There we go. I like oh, it. Wow. I like Cards it. been well, good I'm late gonna... recently, so that watch out. That, that that's not. I won't. Not the... I won't go turn it on. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go catch the end of the U.S. Open if it's still going, and and maybe uh, maybe the end of this hockey game. All right. Well, let's let's hear it for Jack for the great job he did. Thanks a lot. Cheers, he added to this, and of course, Wes Harden always brings it. Man, he brought a lot of great information for us and great whiskey. So, Wes, good job, man. Really Thanks, appreciate everyone. that. With appreciate that, I'll turn well, off the video. Well. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks, guys. See you all soon. All Thank right. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.